Well, you can see from the title up there that I'm going to take you to another weird book in the Old Testament. Wonderful book, wonderful little book that we find there. Uh, I want to give uh, gratitude to God for uh, the 35 people that came to uh, the residence in, Marriott Residence in, uh, over the weekend and worked through the history of the church to hear what Jesus was saying. Uh, I think we all learned together what a challenge that is to, to, to attune our hearts and our ears uh, to really hear what God is saying uh, as we walk through the history of the church. And it was, I think, a fascinating experience for the people who participated. I'd encourage them to kind of spread the word of the things that they learn. And some of what we're going to look at today from Haggai is certainly relevant to that uh, and relevant also for Advent. Advent is kind of the period in the church where people get ready for Jesus' coming. And it's just the idea of preparation for the coming of the Lord. And in a very real sense, I think that's part of what the work of uh, Healing the Heart of the Church is about, is, is that we want to kind of get ourselves right. And you're not only going to have, I think, the experience of that, but then with a new pastor coming as well. Uh, just to get everything uh, uh, kind of ready and straight, all hearts kind of attuned uh, to what God has next for you here at South End. Uh, I love the picture that Greg found and put on our uh, bulletin uh, this week. It's life out of whack. Out of whack, isn't that just a great phrase? Out of whack. Uh, I, mean, I mean, who knows where that came from? I actually did a Google search on whack to find out what, you know, is it a noun or a verb? Uh, you know, if you're out of it, you know, is it a commodity? That, you know, so, so you know, if you have whack, what does that mean? Uh, you know, it, it's like, but we all kind of know when someone says uh, things are out of whack, we know what they mean, you know. Some of you probably have your back out of whack, or your knees are out of whack. Sometimes it's relationships that get out of whack. You know, the people I work with, uh, you know, the way I relate to it, it's out of whack. Uh, sometimes it's our spouses, sometimes it's our kids, and sometimes it's even God. Things are out of whack in our relationship with God. And the book of Haggai was written at a time when things were out of whack. In fact, God sent his prophets. It's usually when they came. It's when things were out of whack. And he has a very interesting message, very relevant. Those who were there at the residence inn yesterday will uh, hear echoes of a lot of the things that we talked about in what Haggai has to say. And uh, again, if you don't know this, or if you've forgotten it, I actually belong to an organization called Blessing Point. Blessing Point draws that name, Blessing Point, from the book of Haggai, and I'll show you that at the end of the message today. But before we look into God's Word together, find out how to get back in whack. Let's go before His throne once more in prayer. Lord, this is your church and we are your people. And we gather here in your name because, Lord, having been redeemed by the blood of our Savior, we belong to you now. And we thank you that you've knit us together with other people who know you as well and call us to this place where we can worship you together and serve you together. And we just pray, Lord, as this church gets ready for its new pastor. And we just think about uh, the coming of the Lord at Christmas season often uh, provides for us. Uh, no pastor is that, but at the same time, we are excited by the things you are doing here. And we just give you glory and praise for it. We pray our worship has pleased you today. And now, Lord, as we open your word, uh, we, all of us, need you to speak to us and to feed us and to lead us and to guide us. Convict us, Lord, where we need that too. 
but may the end result be that the glory of your name grows brighter as a result of what takes place here today. For we ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Not sure what I did to deserve that, but we'll accept it. The book of Haggai, as I have taken you, like I say, to a number of prophets and minor prophets particularly, they have wonderful messages that often uh, get passed over by New Testament believers that we tend to stay in the New Testament. Uh, sometimes it's a lot clearer. We don't know a lot of the history or historical situations that the Old Testament prophets were speaking to. Haggai is like the prophet Zechariah I talked about uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, he was post-exilic, and if you remember, there were three major periods of Israel's history. There was the pre-exile, before they went to Babylon. There is the exile, the 70 years that they're in Babylon. And there's the post-exile, or post-exilic. And there are three prophets of the post-exilic period. There's Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And Haggai, again, I'll just remind you of what I told you a couple weeks ago, that this was a time when they came back into the land after 70 years, and I would just allow your, I want your brain to kind of, uh, in, uh, kind of get around uh, what it would have been like if right now in your community, every house on your street was burned down. Just, I, I mean, there's people who are experiencing that out in California and other places. But uh, if every house was burned down, and then you left for 70 years and came back and you think, what would, what would home look like? But that's what the Israelites experienced. They came back to these cities in Judah and they had been flattened. They had been burned up. Uh, all the walls had been torn down. They had nothing. There was no infrastructure at all. They brought seed to plant but they were going to have to wait a season for that to, to kind of spring up. And so, I mean, you talk about a struggle to survive. These people are struggling so hard. But one of the things that God had taught them, the reason they went into exile, is they had worshipped idols for, for centuries. They had gone more and more deeply into idolatry, worshipping other gods. And so God sent them into exile, and as they're going into exile into Babylon, the Babylonian roads, as they are marching up to the great gates of the city of Babylon, every brick, they were made of bricks, and every brick had on it stamped in Aramaic to the glory of Marduk. And you just figure those exiles have their heads down, and as they're marching into that city, to the glory of Marduk just gets burned into their brains. It's people who are now experiencing God's discipline because they had turned from him. And so while in exile, the community of the Jews, Israelites, purified their faith. They turned back to the Lord wholeheartedly. And under great men like Daniel and Ezra and Zerubbabel, they began to worship the Lord again. And as they turned and became more and more committed, God raised up a king named Cyrus who set them free to go back to their land. Unheard of, but this Persian king took over for the Babylonians and set all the peoples free to go back to their original homeland. So back they came, now with the Lord fully in their hearts. And so they decided the first thing they were going to do was rebuild the temple, that which was the center of their worship. And they got started, they came back into the land in 536 BC. 536 BC, and they, the first thing they started to do was lay the foundation for the temple. Solomon's temple had been torn down but they're going to build a new one. And they laid the foundation, and just at that moment, remember, they've got no military, police force, no protection. The nations around them did not want to see them kind of strengthen their identity, wanted to keep the Israelites weak. And one major group, and you'll know their name if you've hung around church any length of time, the Samaritans threatened them. If you build that temple, we will bring our army in. 
And the Jews were so frightened, they stopped. In 536, they had started, got the foundation, and then they stopped. And they stopped and thought, well, we've got other things we can do. We'll wait until this threat dies down, and then we'll start again. We'll start building again. And so a year passed, and somebody probably in a uh, you know, congregational meeting raised their hand and said, are we going to start building the temple again? And there were some people, mm, no, I'm not sure the time's right yet. And maybe a year later, they said, well, you know, are we going to start building the temple again? Uh, it's still not optimum. So, so instead, what they worked on was their houses. This went on for 16 years. And things now were out of whack. So God sent the prophet Haggai to them. And we read, starting in verse 1 of chapter 1, In the second year of Darius, the king on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says, You know, it's probably never a good thing if God quotes you. Probably never a good thing if God quotes you. This people says, the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. So they kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And, you know, it's kind of like going to church, you know. If you're a faithful churchgoer, if you miss a Sunday, you get sick or something like that, or you have to travel or something like that, you really miss it. If you miss two weeks in a row for some reason, well, you still kind of miss it. You miss three weeks in a row, you're thinking, you know, ah, I kind of miss it this morning. You miss four weeks in a row, you start to scratch your head and wonder why you ever went in the first place. Well, I had missed 16 years of this. And thus says, this people says, the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? So again, this, now we see what the Israelites were doing. All the while, while they were ignoring, kind of uh, pouring resources in to build the temple, the place that would be the center of their worship, they are now to the point of paneling their billiard room. I mean, they're building their swimming pools now in their backyards. They, they are way beyond just what would be normal for construction. And they, they, but they keep embellishing their own homes, and it's clear that their priorities are out of whack. Way out of whack. Because building the house of God and pouring their energies into the house of God has seemed to be a negative thing. And so they have turned their attention, they have poured their energy into something else. Is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? And then God begins to unpack what he has done to try and communicate to his people that things are not right. He says, now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. Well, I identify with that one. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. They have now begun to experience, and this is the way of God with his people. He starts to discipline them at the level of resources. Resources start 
to go down. And they keep working hard, and sometimes they're even working really hard. And it doesn't change the fact that for all their hard work, resources are going down. So the impact of that is more and more frustration. But here's what they've started to do. They've started, you remember that commercial here not that long ago of the settlers? Remember the settlers? You know, that, that they don't have dish TV, they have some kind of lame thing that they're doing because they, they're settlers. They settle for the way things are. They don't need anything new. They don't need anything better. We're, we're happy with what it is. We're settlers. I watch church people fall into that pattern of behavior all the time. They become settlers. They settle for things being out of whack. And they think it's the way things are. And yet resources, God is communicating, because resources keep declining. And it's like, why is this happening? And God lets us know things are out of whack. Things are out of whack. He says it again. In case we missed it the first time, sometimes God needs to repeat himself. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That's what the people yesterday, Friday night and Saturday, were doing. Is, is they walked through the history considering our ways as a church. Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. And then he repeats again the nature of the discipline. You look for much, but when behold, it comes to little. And when you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because my house... Because of my house which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. So you're taking care of your own house. But God's house, and what's happening to God's house, does not seem to be the place where I want to invest my energy. The time has not come, even the time, to do that. For, again, God just makes it super clear. He underscores it to my mind. Therefore, because of you, verse 10, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew and the earth has withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the, on the land and on the mountains and on the grain and on the new wine, on the oil and on what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, on all the labor of your hands. How frustrating it gets when we are working hard, when we are trying to make a living or trying to do the best we can, but our priorities are wrong and we just watch it come to nothing. So God says, consider your ways. And then I believe he's also saying, it's time to change your ways. Don't just consider them. Change them. Make things right again. Get the priorities straight again. Move in the direction of establishing a sense of this is the place where God is building his people into a dwelling place for himself. And so that is where we're going to pour in our energies because God is going to be first in our lives, not second or third after a bunch of other things I have on my agenda, but first. And I have to consider that maybe the frustration, the things I've been going through are because my priorities are out of whack. Well, wonderfully, the people in Haggai's day heard God speak to them through the prophet. And especially at the leadership level, they began to change, they began to reorient themselves. And so you come to the end of Haggai and he kind of summarizes what he's already said, verse 17 of chapter 2. 
He says, I smote you in every work of your hands with blasting wind, mildew, and hail, and yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Do consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, God just wants them to write that on the calendar, circle it in red. I want you to remember that from this day, when the temple of the Lord was founded, in other words, they've done the work now, they've rebuilt the temple. From this day forward, consider, is the seed still in the barn? Even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree, it has not borne fruit yet. From this day, circle the day. From this day, I will bless you. This is the blessing point for a church, for ministry. When priorities, when things are out of whack, to together with one heart and one mind start to get things back in whack. So at an individual level, I think God says, consider your ways. At a corporate level, God says, consider your ways. If there has been a decline in resources, if there's been a, frust a growing frustration with how hard we're working and how little there seems to show for it, then all of that may be just God in his love letting us know that we need to consider our ways and to change our ways. And I hope that that is something that we can all do as we gather around the Lord's table today. If even our priorities have shifted a little bit. If, if we, we've just started to love the ravens a little bit more than God. <laughs> or the Steelers, or the Redskins, or whoever. Or the Cowboys, even the Cowboys. <laughs> that maybe we need to consider our ways. And change our ways. And put God first. And so as this Christmas season, this Advent season, this idea of God coming to dwell in our midst is a, is a part of our worship and our singing, that's what we want to experience every time we walk through those church doors, that we are coming into the presence of God. And when we're gathered in his name, he shows up. He shows up and does what only he as God can do in our hearts and lives. Amen? Amen? Let's bow together for prayer. Oh Lord, as we gather around this table today to take those elements that are symbols of what you have done to bind us together, that we now ingest symbolically your flesh and your blood knowing that you've given your body as a sacrifice in your life to redeem our lives. And all of that is not just for us as individuals, it's for us that you have knit us together in a body to be your bride. And Lord, let us feel the binding power of these elements as we share in them today. May we all consider our ways and get our priorities straight and get our hearts right and that you would prepare us not just for Christmas but for a restoration event when we look at the things we learned at Healing the Heart and Lord this church gets ready for the next man that you've called to be their pastor. Just may all of this Lord be indeed a blessing point for the people of South End. We thank you today for the privilege that is ours to gather around you and share this meal. For we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.